everybody. It is certainly true that not every Ferrari is as great as you may hope. They're not all universally loved, if even just for the way that some of them look. However, even in such illustrious company, there are models that really stand out. One is the F355, once dubbed by St. Jeremy Clarkson himself as the greatest car in the world ever, an opinion that on many occasions I have found myself agreeing with. In fact, just recently I had the chance to sample an F355 Challenge and found myself falling in love with the model all over again. Though the 355 was followed by many truly brilliant cars, I think there is only one which can claim to have received the same universal adoration. That is the 458 Italia. However, on the one and only occasion that I got to drive one, it impressed me, but I didn't fall in love with it. Today, in much better conditions than last time, I'm revisiting the 458 and finding out if this has what it takes to dethrone the 355 as the greatest of all time. Italia is the direct successor to the Ferrari F430. The way Ferrari do things is they don't tend to do facelifts. Instead, they alternate big changes for the chassis or the engine. So the F430 had an all new engine, but a chassis that was ultimately related to that in the 360. In theory then, what you have here is a car with the engine from an F430, only slightly better and an all new chassis. But the truth is for this car, Ferrari went a lot further than that. This car debuted in 2009, and that's important to remember because then the McLaren 12C was still a good couple of years away. Instead, Ferrari's attention would almost certainly have been on their rivals over at Santa Gata because for the last decade up to this car's introduction, Lamborghini had been giving Ferrari a fairly bloody nose in an arena that up until then they'd more or less had to themselves, that of the entry-level supercar for Ferrari, the V8 engine stuff, and for Lamborghini, the V10 engine Gallardo, and later the Huracan. Perhaps it's a little bit harsh on Ferrari's engineers to imply that it's only the presence of the Lamborghini that made them work so hard for this car. After all, there are plenty of cases in the past where they really went to town, the 355 being a prime example, born out of the somewhat unloved 348. In that regard, the 458 actually had a much harder task because the F430 was in itself actually quite well received, generally being a little bit better light than the 360. So what did the bods down at Maranello do to create this? First off, you have an all new body with a new styling language, penned by Donato Coco over at Pininfarina. This is particularly significant because that makes this one of the last Ferraris ever to be designed by the famous Italian styling house. In so many ways, the chassis is actually one of the least radical parts of the car. Like the outgoing F430, it was chiefly aluminium. However, in place of that car's double wishbone all round, here you have double wishbone at the front with a multi-link setup at the back. A good indicator though of the extent to which Ferrari went with this car can be found in the engine, often a highlight of any Italian car, super or otherwise. Here you have another example of Ferrari's F136 family, the V8 shared with the Maserati line. It is a direct successor to the old 4.3 litre unit found in the F430 and on the base of it the two real changes are an increase in displacement by around 200cc to bring it up to 4.5 litres and the introduction of direct injection. But look at the numbers and they'll tell you that this wasn't exactly a gentle makeover. The old car chucked out some 490 PS, this another 80 more. 570, bringing it in line with the 5.2 litre engine in the V10 Gallardo Superleggera. Coincidence that this car makes 10 horsepower more than the regular Gallardo of the time? Possibly, possibly not. Torque similarly was improved. The old F430 made just over 340 pound foot. This just shy of 400. That's about 540 newton meters. Of perhaps even more significance and controversy though was the gearbox because here for the first time ever you had no 
manual option. The F430 taking its place as the final mid-engine V8 Ferrari that offered you that glorious gated shifter. The logic behind the decision really was simple. First off, it allowed the engineers greater freedom by not having to design a car around two transmission options. Secondly, come the end of the F430's life, very few people were actually buying a manual. But in good news, in place of the old F1 semi-automated manual of the older cars, here you have a seven-speed dual-clutch box. This was not the first Ferrari so equipped. That honor went to the California. And while I have something of a thing for the F1 box in my Scuderia, even I must confess that overall, this is a big improvement. But Ferrari did not stop there, because they also introduced an all-new interior layout that still feels somewhat up-to-date. First off, because Ferrari up until very, very recently were still using this. In fact, even in the Portofino M, the 812 GTS, the interior is very much like this. It was only with the introduction of the SF90 Stradale and subsequently the Roma and the 296 that Ferrari have moved away from this configuration. In truth, I can understand exactly why, because it's fantastic. Up front and center, you have a nice big, very clear taco. Then on each side of that, a digital screen showing you a variety of different information depending on how you have it configured, including speed, temperatures, and trip information. Though crucially, not MPG. Out went the old Fiat-derived indicator wash wipe stalks, and in came this new steering wheel layout. The idea being, it will place all the vital functions at your thumb tips. Many were quick to criticize that, but honestly, I actually really quite like it. And now, having spent quite a bit of time in cars with a system like it, I really do think it's better. Just about every reviewer in period concluded that not only was this car a great leap on from the F430, it was also one of Ferrari's greatest ever. A title not easily won. However, I have never found myself that in love with the 458 for several reasons, I think. It's taken me a while to gel with the car's styling, and even now there are some angles where it works brilliantly and some where it does not. I think my big issue is the lack of side scoops. There's no big intake on the side of the car, and to me, that's a key hallmark of any proper red-blooded supercar. The reasoning for all of this, naturally, is Ferrari's obsession with aerodynamics, and here they were working tirelessly to improve every little facet of the car that they could. This also included upgrades for the E-diff, the traction control system, the Manatino down here that controls everything, and just about every aspect of the car that you might imagine. Even small things like the window switches, previously a little bit horrible and nasty, now at least look good, even if they don't really work any more reliably than before. As it happens, the last car I drove belongs to Damien from The Car Guys, who's currently on a mission to drive every Ferrari. And it should tell you a lot that he's still keeping his 458 despite having experienced a lot of other metal. If you would like any information from him about the 458 ownership experience, or indeed his opinion on many of Marinello's greatest hits, I suggest you check out his channel, thecarguys.tv. He is a lovely chap and has helped me on many occasions. So then, looks aside, what is it that I didn't really gel with in the 458? The steering didn't really talk to me all that much, the gearbox frustrated, the exhaust was infuriating, and it was a car that, despite all of its amazing numbers, failed to excite. Crucially, in the time between that review and this, I have also acquired my 430 Scuderia, and if I were to buy one of these, I'd likely have to do an almost straight swap with that, such is the increase of late in 458 prices. So then, second time around, with better weather and a familiar road, how does this car fare? Let's see. where the 458 Italia is able to shock me in a good way. Those include, really, the first thing I noticed, the ride quality. In sport mode, without bumpy road engaged, 
this car is just about perfect. One of the things I think Ferrari has achieved here, which really is impressive, is increased the breadth of this car's capabilities and made it all that more usable. It is McLaren who are often cited with having class-leading ride quality, far better than you'd expect from any supercar, but the reality is Ferrari had already been creating supercars with excellent ride quality for a very long time, and this is no exception. It's incredibly well damped. Even in race mode, it never really batters you around in the way that many a Lamborghini does. If anything, I would say compared to the original McLaren, the 12C, the ride in here might actually be superior. The damping does feel that little bit more sophisticated. The 650 perhaps turns the tables, and we'll talk about more McLaren comparisons soon, but this really is incredibly good. Very supple, well controlled, and brilliantly damped. Next up, the engine. Sure, low down, it doesn't have the punch or fireworks of the McLaren or indeed the later 488, but this is an old school performance engine, the last naturally aspirated Ferrari V8. Here, an incredible 9,000 RPM redline. And if at any point you feel it's not really quick enough, just change down a gear and try again, because trust me, it will be. It also makes this car very accessible, very friendly. It's not daunting or intimidating to drive. It's one of those cars where you think, ah, I don't know if I'm really going that quick. You look down and you go, oh, no, no, I am. Even there, I thought I was changing a peak RPM. That was seven. Seven. That should be kind of peak RPM, maybe eight for a sporty car. This goes to nine. It revs like an S2000, but has double the cylinders, more than double the capacity. In fact, Let's find that red line, and I need to drop down many, many gears to get it sensibly. There you go. <laughs> Gonna be careful along here, because there were some horses earlier, and I am somewhat socially responsible. Right, this thing. Let's talk about this thing, shall we? Because this is important. This leads us on to a few other points. I said I don't like the exhaust in this car, and that's true. Yet again, there are two reasons for that. First off, it just doesn't make the Ferrari noise. You know the one I mean? This one. The annoying thing about it is that actually, if you're standing outside the car watching it go past as I was earlier, you do get a little bit of that familiar Ferrari V8 wail. My theory for this is the same as with the 430 Scuderia. For whatever reason, with these cars, Ferrari have set them up so you've got two rows of four cylinders, and as this is a flat plane crank design, it doesn't work like your traditional American cross plane V8. That's why it doesn't burble. But if you don't let the exhausts cross over, it will just sound like two four cylinders having a bit of an argument. And it's not a particularly pleasant noise. What you need to get that beautiful noise is a crossover. Then it's a real eight cylinder sound. And that's why I think you get the difference in tone. In here, you're just hearing two four cylinders having a fight, but from outside, the sound is crossing over outside the car. I have this with the 430. I follow it and think it sounds great. Then I sit in it and think it sounds horrible. It's okay, a little bit nicer than the 430, and I love the look of the F40 aping triple exhaust, though maybe I do prefer the very business-like dual cannons on the Scud. However, it's just not the most sonorous Ferrari. The other issue is that it's very, very keen to open the exhaust valves. Let me put the car into race mode, which many people will use a lot of the time. I'm doing 50 mile an hour, six gear. There you go. That, that's no throttle at all. And it, it's straight open. Sport mode, not so bad. You need to push a little bit harder, but even so, you kind of wonder why they bother putting valves in there at all. Race mode is just trying to open all the time. Now the exhaust valve controller I've set to open all the time on occasion just because it makes the noise that you hear in the video a little bit more pleasant. However, it is an element of the car that really does frustrate, as does the steering. This is an area where Ferrari really are criminally inconsistent. Some cars, brilliant steering up there with the very best. The F12, though it took me a while to realize it, is very good. The old 348 is brilliant, but then you get stuff like the 355. I love that car. I really do think it's one of the greatest cars in the world ever, but the steering is pants, really quite bad, a low light of the car. In the 360, it was a little better, and in the 430, better again, and in the 430 Scuderia, it got to a point where actually, it was once again sensational. Then they forgot how to do good steering, because here, it's just, well, 
Famously darty, though, this particular car doesn't feel as darty as I recall. Certainly not compared to, say, the F12. However, it's inert. Not really a lot coming through it. It's only when you've got some serious speed on that it waits up and actually starts to properly communicate. And that's frustrating. Maybe it's simply a programming issue with the variable assistance hydraulic steering, but it should really be better. It needs to be better in a car like this. Other good things, storage space, as with many a Ferrari, absolutely sensational. I also love the view out the front. Those really sharply sculpted front arches are beautiful. They remind me somewhat of those in my Lotus Evora. I'm in race mode now, bumpy road engaged. There are luxury cars that would struggle along here. It's fine. The Maserati Spider I drove along here shook so badly, my camera nearly fell off. No problem. None whatsoever. This section's quite difficult here. No, nope. car took it just fine. Some real big compressions on this side particularly. Steering's pretty straight. Car's not dragging me off into the hedge. It's wonderful. Torquey, strong, pulls from low down really, really well. Cross country speed, this car has loads of it. Grip, traction, excellent. In the dry, no trouble at all. If it rains, that's what wet mode is for. In here, I would say the difference between sport and race mode doesn't feel quite as pronounced as in some other cars. You notice a slight difference with the gearbox, the traction control, and of course, the exhaust too. But I have to be honest, this is the sort of thing that I think only really becomes apparent after a lot longer with the car. Turning circle, really quite good. Visibility is a mixed bag. Out the front, great. To the side, pretty good. Rear three quarters though, not great. And in this car in particular, rear visibility is tragic. And that's because this has the rollover hoop. In a 360 or 430, that doesn't obscure anything. In here, it's more or less robbed the entirety of your rear view. For that reason, this car's lovely owner, Nick, is debating removing the hoop. But I do quite like it, I have to say. A real highlight of the interior for me is the bucket seats. Not loved by all, but for me, they dramatically improve the feel and feedback from the car, as well as the sense of occasion you get. Worth noting that with Ferraris, unlike other manufacturers, if you specify the four-point harnesses, it will be at the cost of the three-point regular belt. Fuel economy, well, let's face it, you really don't care, but it's not going to be great. It does look and feel considerably more modern than the F430. I would say to someone who isn't used to old school supercars, this is going to be much easier to hop into and just drive. It doesn't feel unnecessarily large on the road, it still does the business, and I can understand why a lot of people would really like it. It's a gorgeous thing to behold. The specification of this particular car with the triple layer yellow, that's the full Italian chef's kiss. Bellissimo. But. And this is a big butt. I'm here in a beautiful, glorious mid-engine V8 Ferrari that sings all the way to 9,000 RPM. I should be having the time of my life. And I'm not. I'm just not. You see, the big cars, the V12s, those are a little bit more GT orientated. Those are wonderful things. But this is the mid-engine one. This is the sports car in the lineup. It should be about those immediate thrills. It should be for the person that has this car, doesn't put many miles on it, but when they do, they really want to enjoy them. And that first time, and now second time around, is where the car just, just struggles a little bit. Even the gearbox, wonderful, lovely, smooth, great around town, and can do an impression of an automatic, which the old F1 could not. But um, it doesn't really excite only once you're at the absolute top reaches of the rev range and in race mode does it really bang those shifts home in a way that kind of interests you but for the most part it just it does the job and it does the job very very well but it lacks the passion fizz and certainly the drama of the 430 scuderia an unfair comparison perhaps but bear in mind whenever a new regular v8 comes out the old special is always used as a benchmark and today the price you pay for one of these at the top end of the market is not that far off if anything crossing over with what you pay for a 430 scuderia those are going to be a higher maintenance car these i think will be easier to own they're better built better put together better engineered many of them may still be carrying an original ferrari warranty which very few scuderias will and certainly very few f430s 
As it happens, the very last of the 458s have only just seen the last of their free services. That seven-year plan was something Ferrari introduced, I think, with this car, and I have to say, was a great idea. Brilliant marketing tactic, and something that made the cars just that little easier to own. Frustratingly, it's at that moment where the 458 should ascend to brilliance where it simply falls short. And more worryingly, it's at that exact moment where the McLaren 650S becomes sensational. If you want a car to go out on a Sunday morning, have a blast and thrill yourself, the McLaren, I'm afraid, is a better car. Sure, for the day-to-day -day stuff, I think the Ferrari is at least as good and in many ways perhaps more of an object of desire. But in terms of steering feel and excitement, the car from Woking had Marinello licked. That engine likewise, despite its amazing technical prowess, it never rewards for ringing it out to the red line. A 911-901 GT3's power plant, by comparison, feels quite a bit more special, despite being less potent. Having now resampled the 458, the car that I really need to revisit is the 488, the missing link. I have driven one before, but in far from ideal conditions, around the New Forest, which is not exactly an ideal test route for a car with near 700 horsepower. That really was Marinello's response to Woking's new Wunderkind, and I need to explore it on my own roads to see just how good it really is. So yeah, anybody who doesn't really know me will be shocked to hear if you have £160,000 in your pocket, save 60 grand of that, buy a McLaren 650S. The 458 is another car that for me, it just falls into that category of, yep, I get it, totally understand anyone that buys one, but for me, it is just lacking what I'm looking for. But I'd be lying if I said I haven't enjoyed myself today. A huge thank you to Nick for bringing his car out, and as ever, to you for watching. Don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and even if you have, make sure to check the bell icon so you'll be notified of every new video release. And whatever it is, I hope to see you for the next one. Bye-bye.